Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Alicia Cohen, the director of the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication. I'm pleased to be here today. I want to welcome everyone to our first event in our series exploring how the media industry has responded to various public health, economic, and social challenge challenges in the past year. Today, I have with me three guests um, who are leaders from Hubbard Radio and Hubbard Broadcasting. I want to introduce them to you. First, um, here is Jenny Morris, who is the chair and chief executive officer of Hubbard Radio. And Jenny can wave, I believe. I don't know if she'll, um, you can see her yet. Um, Dan Seaman, who is the VP of Marketing um, at Market Manager for Minnesota for Hubbard Radio. Thank you, Dan, for joining us. And Kurt Varner, who is KSTP's uh, news director here in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, so I'd like to focus our conversation um, on 2020. First, how Hubbard Broadcasting entered the year and also to discuss some of the challenges that it surmounted both in handling the COVID-19 pandemic and recent uh, social unrest in Minneapolis as well. So I thought, let's go back to the beginning of the year, the beginning of 2020. And um, I wanna direct my first question to you, Jenny, um, if you can unmute. And um, tell me a little bit about some of Hubbard Radio's strategic goals for the year as the year began. Well, we were off to a really terrific start um, and anticipating having the better, best year that we had had in quite some time. And um, so first quarter was shaping up to be the best first quarter that we'd had in a number of years. And we are working on some very long-term strategic questions for the radio company. And the radio company is in the Twin Cities, we're in Northern Minnesota, and then we're in seven other states uh, operating primarily music and entertainment stations uh, with one great exception, WTOP in Washington, DC. So as far as radio goes, we're not, a huge platform company where uh, we operate eight very local markets, um, very local cities, but, but there are certain things that we work on together. And we were just beginning to do some five-year planning when, you know, the earth came shattering to pieces uh, in March. So things quickly changed from what are we doing in the long term to how do we make sure that all of our radio stations can stay on the air, can continuing to deliver service to our communities and how can we help get our clients through this. So from a radio perspective, um, it was simple to some degree as compared to running a 24 hour news operation, which Kirk uh, is involved in, but I'm sure that Dan can share a lot of more specific experiences about what it was like for him to try and keep all of his charges um, working and moving forward. So. As we know, everything changed in uh, March and then changed obviously in the Twin Cities uh, initially uh, at the end of May um, with the death of George Floyd and all that followed. So that would be, those would be my global observations. Thank you. So Dan, could you um, pick up from there and talk a little bit about what changed in the company's day-to-day -day operations? Um, what changes or challenges have you seen um, in, in uh, your position? Yeah, well, wow, uh, significant changes. I mean, we went from um, our entire workforce, which was in the building here, not far from campus, a mile away, um, to probably 75 to 80% of our staff now working remotely. So what we did um, very early on is we, we made the decision as a company, even before the governor had a, a shelter uh, uh, in place um, directive, we sent everybody home to, to work from home with the idea of let's keep our employees safe, first and foremost, but also we needed to ensure the continuity of our business. And our business starts with, with the broadcast studios. And we have... Uh, you know, we have half a dozen studios where we are creating content for three radio stations in this market and 16 radio stations in Northern Minnesota. They're all, they all have their own studios in their markets. So we felt uh, the best decision was to uh, make it as safe as possible for our employees and, and make it as safe as, as possible for on-air staff so we could ensure to bring um, 
our broadcast to our listeners. So we are still mainly working from home, uh, but we do have all of our studios are operating here on campus. Um, they're different than they used to be because nobody's in the same studio. We would have three or four people in one studio. And now we really have, we've created broadcast studios out of production rooms, out of empty offices. Um, and now everybody's in a separate studio just, just to, uh, to keep it uh, socially distanced. So it's changed a lot. Our business took a tremendous um, uh, a downturn, as you can imagine. We do a lot of business with events, with live events. When you think about concerts and you think about sporting events and you think about casinos and all the ways that people gather and they're not gathering now. Uh, restaurants are a big category for us. And it's, uh, it's been a very difficult time for those businesses. And, and certainly advertising is, is not uh, their highest priority right now. Um, so we've, yeah, it, we've, it's changed a lot. I want to give you all a chance to talk a little bit about changes in audience engagement and uh, advertising resume, revenue, but I want to let Kurt, um, Kurt get in um, as well. So from KSTV's perspective, can you talk a little bit about how operations began the year and how things have shifted? Well, uh, my view of the world is a little more pragmatic and, and focused uh, from the side of the television station, which is what I'm responsible for in the news department here. You know, we began the year thinking that the biggest challenge we would face would be the election. Um, you know, January and February was looking at primary cycles and how that was going to play out. And it seems now like decades ago, as opposed to a, a, a few months. But, you know, when um, the pandemic uh, began to develop, you know, the, the initial question was, how do we cover a news story that has global ramifications at the same time as it has local ones and, and how that evolved and as quickly as it evolved. And from a, a tactical standpoint, we made a decision early on to try as hard as we could to focus on preserving a sense of normalcy in terms of the broadcast, uh, keeping the television station on the air is a little different, harder to do from a technology standpoint. Um, radio has some real advantages there and and it may be a little more nimble than the TV side of uh, the business has been, but you know we've had to do the same thing in terms of looking at how we do the job of covering and reporting the news each day, uh, distancing people, having them observe all of the safety precautions that have now become sort of a way of life. But all of that had to happen at the same time we were continuing to go out and gather the news every day. So. Things like, you know, how do you interview somebody when you want to stand six feet away from them and uh, the uh, sudden need to go to the Menards and buy uh, mop handles to stretch microphones out, you know, in front of people and, and do that sort of day-to-day -day tactical uh, work was really the focus of the beginning of the year. And then as the year evolved, obviously, as Jenny mentioned, you know, um, I don't think anybody had on their bingo card for 2020 pandemic. Uh, social unrest and and then you know all of the day-to-day -day normal things you have in terms of running a news operation and oh by the way let's let's put an election um, which depending on which candidate you want to listen to uh, the one thing they seem to agree on is that it's the most important election of our time so all of that's created I think unique challenges and the biggest thing from my viewpoint is managing the people uh, and working with folks and and keeping uh, all of the, um, the elements of managing our human assets, the most important part of our business is, is having our people safe, having them, you know, be able to do their job with as little distractions as possible, but uh, worrying about all of those elements and just keeping people engaged and understanding um, this is an unprecedented time and we're covering what at least in, in my life is the biggest sequence of news stories I've ever seen come along. And I think all of that rolls up into the question of at the end of the day, we're still committed to the idea of being in the information business and uh, getting people reliable and credible information uh, in the face of, you know, constant uh, criticism, not all undeserved of being in the fake news business or uh, having a finger on the scale of what we present, uh, which we, you know, work very hard to make as balanced and um, 
uh, reliable as we possibly can. Thank you um, so much, Kirk. I want to let people know in our audience that they are welcome to um, put questions into the Q&A box that's at the bottom of their Zoom screen um, near the participant tab. Um, and we will, I will um, take questions from our audience members um, after we continue our conversation um, a bit more. Um, so one of the things that each of you has mentioned is the issue of engagement, managing people, and um, figuring out how to, you know, hit the um, improved demand and meet uh, from audiences as well as meet um, new needs that might arise. Ginny, can you talk a little bit about this? How have you um, seen your role as um, a CEO change in this um, setting and what uh, innovations or changes have you made to keep both um, the people that work in um, Hubbard engaged as well as engage with your audiences? Um. I have the distinct uh, pleasure of really working directly with the leaders of all the business operations. And I think uh, one of the good things that has come from that is we talk to each other much more consistently than we used to. We talk every week and at least, and we've got groups of people that talk to each other on a more regular basis than they used to. Um, I started communicating with the entire company, which is about a thousand people spread out across the country on a weekly basis, something that I never did. And I know Dan has really effectively communicated with his team every day of every week since this, since this began. In terms of the listener engagement, we've seen our streaming numbers go up as people are at home uh, working from a different environment than they're accustomed to. You know, so much radio listening typically takes place in the car. So that's a kind of a, a point of vulnerability that, that we knew we were going to encounter. Um, and we have, but our, we've, we've seen our, our streaming numbers go up pretty consi considerably. We've got podcasting platforms. We're active in all the social channels. We've got people who um, we put somebody from a corporate radio perspective um, very much full time on how to increase social and social engagement with uh, our audiences in new and different ways, and how to share learning from one market to another since the pandemic began. So that's all been new. And Dan can probably speak to that in a more granular fashion than I can. Dan, do you wanna answer, address the same issue? Sure, absolutely. I love alliteration. So since the start, you know, we have really focused on communication, connection and collaboration. And honestly, for the first few weeks and even few months, of of the pandemic, um, I saw my role as the chief communications officer more than anything. Um, that that communication, which we got done in the hallways and got done in meeting rooms, was now gone. So, you know, we were we we probably communicated better uh, and have communicated better in the last six months, seven months than we did prior to that. We're we're just doing a much better job keeping people. Uh, in, in the know of what's going on. The next piece that is connection. It's one thing to send out an email every day. Um, and that's important, but connection is harder and that's truly connecting with folks. And we've, we've used Zoom to do that. Certainly we had great advantages this summer to do outdoor meetings and to take advantage of uh, Minnesota summers and some of the meeting spots, whether it be out on Boom Island or some of the parks where we've had an opportunity to bring staff together. Um, and, and this is this is in terms of communicating with staff. I'll talk about listeners and fans in a minute. And then the last piece, which is, has been our biggest challenge, has been collaboration. Uh, you know, the governor has been pretty clear, as, as Alyssa, I think you noted earlier in, the, uh, in our pre-conversation, which was the governor's been clear. If you can work from home, you must work from home. So we have our essential broadcasters here, but that is it. And you know what, we can do a lot of work from home. We can put in sales orders from home and we can send emails and we can do Zooms and we can plan promotions and, and we can do all of our business functions from home. But what, what is really 
impacting us and hurting us is the opportunity to collaborate. And yeah, we can still get together on Zoom and have collaboration meetings and have brainstorming meetings, but it's very different from the organic collaboration that happens in the hallways. And we are really missing that. We are missing that opportunity when, when uh, Lori and Julie from Afternoon Drive on my talk run into uh, Sonia Ungerman, the sales manager from, for, for my talk, and they happened to meet each other in the hallway and just very spontaneously have a conversation and come up with an idea. And that's not happening right now. And we really miss that. We are trying to do as much as we can to facilitate collaboration, but it's, it's so much harder when you're not meeting face to face, that hallway uh, collaboration, if you will. Very quickly, uh, in terms of audience and listeners and fans, four or five years ago, we were very deliberate in our efforts to uh, make sure that our content is available on every platform available. Uh, certainly broadcast is still our main form of distribution, but we were early adopters with our own apps. We were early adopters with streaming on laptops and on desktops, and we were very early adopters on smart speakers like Alexa, and it's really paid off. Um, now listening patterns are completely disrupted. We don't get, uh, the, we don't get mom in the car bringing her kids to school every day anymore in that time in the radio, or we don't get some of those folks that are driving to work every day. So these digital platforms have been really important. I'll give you one example that Ginny touched on, but I'll, but I'll, um, uh, I'll give you a very a specific example. My talk 107.1, which is one of our radio stations in the market, typically uh, pre-pandemic about anywhere from 15 to 25% of listening to that radio station came from the stream, came from a digital device, whether it be a smart speaker, whether it be an app, your mobile, or your desktop. During uh, COVID, that number has increased to 40 to 50% of all the listening is coming from the stream. So our early work uh, building up these platforms has really been important as people discover all these new devices and new ways to consume audio content. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm thinking about uh, all the communication, collaboration, and connection that's just changing in so many different spaces um, of our lives. So I, I love the uh, alliteration. I might uh, use it myself. Kirk, um, I wanted to ask the same question to you, but also fold in a question that has come in from Scott Libin, who's our Hubbard Fellow and who teaches our producing classes in the school. Um, you've done a lot of engaging work at KSCP, um, particularly changing some of your news approaches, Zoom interviews, for example, and um, in and bringing in uh, new ways to engage people working from home. And so Scott's question is, how prominent do you think these uh, Zoom interviews will be post pandemic and how many of those now working from home may never come back to the newsroom uh, live? So both, how are you innovative in engagement and what, what of those innovations might be here to stay? You know, I think it's kind of a, a, a two act play in that the, the first part of it is uh, to answer the question of, you know, do I think Zoom interviews or video chats uh, will be here to stay? The answer to that's without a doubt. Um, first of all, you know, I keep going back to the, the, the initial point of we don't really know where we are in the game here. Um, you know, a number of companies are talking about employees being out of the office through um, or, or well in the summer of 2021. And I think for the most part, that's still a best estimate of what we hope in terms of progress on a vaccine and, and treatment of, of the virus, but also just the evolution of, of business as a whole uh, continues to be a bit of a moving target. Um, I think every technique we've learned in terms of reporting and news gathering during the um, the pandemic and, and that part of the you know, news agenda of the day will continue to be in place. I think we'll probably come back to the idea of 
you, you still want interviews to be a face-to-face -face proposition whenever they can be. And there are some things we lose in the electronic process, but it also presents a certain level of access that I don't know we were as comfortable with before we started and now we, we've done it. And, and there used to be a, um, a standard reference in the industry that you would call something broadcast quality, meaning it looked like it was done by professionals. And that line got blurred on, I think, day three of, of working in this unique situation. But uh, beyond that, you know, I still think it's a collaborative process. I mean, I, I, we've made the decision to try to keep as many of our people in the newsroom as possible, uh, again, safely. But the reality of it is, is that, that news gathering, particularly for television, but really for anywhere, is still a team sport. And if you don't have that collaboration, if you don't have those levels of editing, you know, you really are, I think, depriving the listeners and viewers of the idea that what they're getting has been vetted, has been researched, has been looked over by more than one set of eyes. And there's that expectation that we do that uh, no matter what happens, you know, that, that folks don't really want to know all of how the sausage gets made. They just want to make sure that at the end, it, it's still tasty and it's what they expect as, as, a, as a thing. And so I think news falls into that category. And, and that's been a lot of our focus is how do we safely operate um, on all the levels, you know, whether it's using video tools uh, online, whether it's interviewing folks outside when we might normally interview them inside. I think all of those things are going to be part of the palette we use. The, the sense that, you know, there's been the phrase thrown around a lot, what's the new normal going to be? I think the, the new normal is going to be exactly what the old normal was, which is you try every day to adapt to the conditions you're faced with and do the best job you can uh, of producing content and information that people want and, and desire. Uh, it's still a business at the end of the day. We do this uh, because it makes sense to do it. But also, you know, if you aren't nimble, if you aren't willing to adapt, then you know, you get, you run the risk of being left behind and uh, we're not about to do that. So I, I, to answer Scott's question directly, I think it's all going to be part of what we do for the foreseeable future. Um, related to this, um, Jenny, um, there's been a lot of innovation um, within, you know, radio, within um, traditional television broadcasting. Um, what opportunities um, do you see as a leader for um, what um, one of my faculty members has written a question about more kind of cross media innovation. In other words, have you seen um, as a leader um, that when you're meeting with other leaders within your companies or across um, companies within um, Hubbard, uh, the Hubbard groups that um, that there's learning that's occurring um, in new ways with um, the situation? And if so, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I, I think that it, this time that we're in has certainly accelerated and magnified some evolution in the media space in that newspapers now produce audio, video content, radio stations, television stations now produce printed content. You know, everything is sort of melting in terms of the silos that we used to all work in. And we all need to figure out ways to communicate effectively in all these disciplines that traditionally belong to other disciplines. Um, so I think that, that that is an evolution that had begun and it's just been accelerated and continues to accelerate during this time of the velocity of news that is occurring is, as high as I can remember it being in quite a long time, as well as this disruption in how people live their daily lives. So I think, um, you know, we we're, we keep trying and, and keep evolving and every day we tinker a little more and we tinker a little more. And Dan learns from his peers in, you know, St. Louis or Washington, DC or Seattle. Um, and I'm sure that Kirk has that experience as well. We are still rel pretty siloed here on the Hubbard campus between radio and television. And if Dan was running a, a straight-ahead news operation, I think it, it might be different. 
um, Kirk and his team provide service elements to the radio stations, but there's not a lot of collaborative project work that goes on beyond day-to-day -day providing of service. I don't know if Dan or Kirk have anything to add to that. They may. Yeah, Dan uh, or Kirk, if you want to hop in. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I, I would add to that a little bit in saying that one of, and not to sound too much like a, a cheerleader here, but one of the real advantages of a company like this one is that it's nimble and, and that the innovation, the idea of innovating and trying things really has a long history here. And there's a great commitment to doing that. Um, you know, uh, Jenny references that there's not maybe as much cross media innovation here. And I'm not sure that that's entirely true because one of the biggest things we were focused on at the beginning of the year was looking at the television station group. And we're small, we're only six TV stations for Hubbard Television, but uh, we really wanted to do a major um, deep dive, uh, look at what we do online and particularly for our websites. And one of the things we, we quickly realized is that our colleagues at WTOP in Washington have a truly best of breed digital operation uh, and that their approach to how they operate their website for a 24 hour um, news radio, news content platform and, and obviously one of the most important cities of the world really had ways we could take their knowledge and their experience and incorporate it. And so that's been a direct way we've been able to take knowledge that exists inside the company, not in a place we might normally look for it uh, and go, wait, you guys have already done this work. You know, tell us what you did, why you did it. And we can take that and build upon that. And, and that's what we're in the midst of doing to uh, launch um, a really major overhaul of our digital presence uh, in the very near future. And, and I think that sort of thing from that level on a very global level to even smaller, you know, pieces of information that move back and forth amongst our organizations. Um, th there's not a day that you can't learn something here or ask the question, what if we tried this, uh, that you don't get a fair amount of support for, well, let's be smart about it, but if it makes sense to do it, let's go forward and try. Um, one of the, uh, I'd like, Dan, if you wouldn't mind, can you think a little bit um, or speak to a little bit some of the innovations that's been, that have been going on um, in your shop and uh, the ways in which um, uh, these changes might continue or, or, or may not uh, post-pandemic? You bet. I think Jenny mentioned um, in, in the introductory statements uh, when you asked her, you know, how did the year start? Uh, the year started great. And the year started with five-year planning that really had begun late in 2019. And it's interesting is what happened these last seven months is a lot of these five-year plans became seven-month plans. So much of what we were planning to do on the digital front, particularly when it comes to content distribution, and that we were laying out plans on how to best utilize our resources because we're making this transition. We're making this transition from sort of this, this traditional broadcast um, dis distributed uh, entity to now uh, onto the digital space, which has so many different platforms. And broadcast is still without question the biggest part of our business, but every day we move more into the digital realm. Well, this really supercharged it. And I'd mentioned the work we had done really laid a foundation, I think, for us to stay really connected to our listeners um, during this time. But I'll, I'll give you a, a good example, a very specific example that I've been dealing with uh, in, the, in the recent weeks. Traditionally, we have had promotion directors and promotion staffs at these radio stations. And these are the folks who are there to be at events. They're typically, I was one. That's how I started in this business. I drove a van and hung up banners and and gave away, you know, suntan samples back when you gave away suntan samples. Um, and, and that, and we still have staffs that do that. But I've argued and continue to argue uh, now, and it, again, this time is supercharged, that the new promotion directors are really social media strategists. They're really digital content creators. 
And we are now moving resources out of, out of staffs that used to go to concerts to drive their van, our van around to reach 10,000 people. I'd rather take those resources and put them on digital platforms where we can reach hundreds of thousands of listeners, fans, and potential listeners and fans. So, you know, we're looking at that every day on, on how we can move to these new platforms. We, we now, you know, Ginny mentioned the podcasting business. We have one of the largest podcasts in the Midwest. It's called Garage Logic. It's probably not aimed at uh, uh, most of the folks uh, on, this, on this Zoom, although it might be. We're seeing a younger audience because of the new platform. But this is a radio station that was built on AM radio. Um, I wish I could see you because I would have you raise your hands to everybody who listens to AM radio, but I'm not sure I need to see you to not see your hands go up. Um, it's just a platform that is not as relevant to your generation as it was our generation. We took a program that was built on AM radio and moved it over to the podcast space, the digital space, and it's there every day. And you can listen to it where you want it, when you want it, and how you want it. And we actually have now more listeners listening to that podcast than we had listening to AM radio two years ago. And I think you're going to see us continue to make sure that we are putting our content on any platform that you are all looking to find audio content, whether it be spoken word, whether it be music, whether it be entertainment, whether it be news. I want to pivot for a minute to the 2020 election, as all of you have brought that up as something that um, was certainly on your minds at the beginning of the year related to strategic planning. One of our faculty members, Valerie Belair Gagnon, who is the director of our um, Minnesota Journalism Center, has um, asked, can you talk a little bit more about some of the best um, innovation that you've developed around the 20 or during the, or the 2020 election, especially thinking about media habits and where people may uh, related, where people might want to get uh, political talk or um, news or information. Uh, um, this message is to anyone, you know, this question uh, wasn't, yeah, go ahead, Dan. I'm going to let, I think, I think Kirk's most relevant to take that, but right. I want to make an observation. I love that you use the word pivot because I think when this is all said and done, the three words or terms that we're going to remember from the pandemic are pivot, unprecedented, and you're on mute. <laughs> I so agree. Kirk, on, you can take it from here. Nice. That's a nice setup. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I, it's interesting to me, I think most of the real innovation, I guess I would speak to in terms of the election has been driven by the idea of how do we do more than just headlines? How do we do more than just report this poll or that um, appearance and try to add some context and depth to what we're doing. And that's always a challenge, but this year probably more so because, you know, we don't have all the mechanisms in place. We've had a real difficult time trying to even engage candidates in the idea of doing debates because of the logistics of that. Um, we've seen that on a national level. We've certainly seen it on a state level uh, across Minnesota. Uh, I think the other big thing we've done a lot more of is listening uh, to what we get from folks via the various social media platforms. You know, once upon a time, you measured viewer interest by mail and phone calls. And that's in, in this newsroom, I will tell you, is almost completely converted to what we get via email, um, uh, Facebook comments, what have you, just as samplings of what people are asking, what they're concerned about, uh, we, we, we measure the engagement of posts very carefully in terms of trying to understand what, what, what do you want beyond the obvious. The surface level of covering the news is pretty standard. The idea of going deeper than that and trying to dig into things that we typically in the past might not have done on a local level, I guess I would say as much, we're certainly paying a lot more attention to for election night itself. You know, I would tell you that right now, every news director I know in America is trying to figure out how do we run up to an election that probably won't be one night, that, that we really have at least some coloring that feels very familiar 
to, you know, uh, Bush v. Gore, you know, does the election run seven days in Minnesota? You know, if you postmark a ballot by election day itself, it can get counted up to a week after election night. So all of those things are requiring, I think, daily uh, conversations about why, why this is a different election, how we cover it differently. But we're still doing some things that I think are basics. Uh, we will start on the 20th of October, providing free airtime to candidates uh, inside of our newscast uh, to deliver one minute you know, statements about why they're running and what, you know, what they're uh, looking to address with their, uh, their voters. And so I, I think the innovation piece of it is really the, how do you cover an election that, that frankly, despite all the rhetoric that's thrown up about it, how do you cover an election that really does have the potential to, I hate the word, but I'll use it, be unprecedented in so many ways. And a lot of that's, you know, the basic news gathering we all know and love. And a lot of it's the, how do we try to measure what people are interested in and what they're telling us they're interested in, and then diving beyond that uh, to make sure we're, we're connecting on those questions as best we can. If I could interject, um, but Kirk, you transformed the format of your 10 o'clock news in the midst of all this uh, crisis, right? So, yes. and, and I would say innovated dramatically what a 10 o'clock newscast look, looks like. And I think people on the call would appreciate hearing some of the background and some of what you've learned. So uh, Jenny's talking about a project that uh, began for us back in March, actually late March. Um, we were challenged by the idea that we knew of some stations in the country that were looking at their late newscast and considering the idea of creating a late news format that would be basically all coronavirus all the time, that, you would, that every night there were so many stories about the, the virus, the development of the virus, um, all of the things that people were learning. If you can remember that not that long ago, uh, wearing a mask wasn't something you did every day. Um, having a uh, swab stuck up your nose so far that you cry, at least I did when I had my first test, um, weren't, weren't part of the lexicon. So, <clears throat> excuse me. We began looking at the late newscast, and, and when that idea surfaced at some other TV stations, we, we thought, well, it's an interesting idea, but what does it sustain? So what, back when we were naive and thought the virus might be a six-month proposition, uh, my question was, well, if we're going to change the way we do news here in this one broadcast at 10 p.m., what's the sustaining of it after the pandemic, hoping that there would be an after? And so that began a series of questions. And, and what ultimately it led us to in, in short form is the idea of doing a newscast that wasn't driven by the standard principle of trying to jam as much content into a, a block of time as we could. Uh, local television newscasts have been slaves to story count, I'll call it, for a long period of time. And so Nightcast started with the, with the not altogether revolutionary idea of what if we threw that idea of trying to jam everything we could into a 35 minute format and went after what we think is one of the real strengths of our staff here, which is storytelling, that we have the ability to tell a story deeper than just headline and three sound bites is, is a person once described every local television news story. Um, and so that began that process of rethinking that, doing rehearsals, launching that broadcast um, at the end, uh, the beginning of May, not realizing that by the end of May, we'd have another, you know, once in a lifetime or at least once in a while story with the civil unrest here. So that to me is, is indicative of, of a large scale of innovation, but there have been many smaller pieces along the way. But Nightcast is, you know, just one of those approaches to how do you take what is standard fare and re-examine it and reinvent it to be something that's different, not just for the sake of being different, but truly 
creates a, a unique vehicle for, for conveying information in a form we didn't necessarily think we might have done when we started down the road on this. The longer and kind of creative storytelling seems there's been sort of uh, opportunity for that. I wanted to hear from um, Jenny and perhaps Dan too, um, uh, a response to uh, a question that has come in from uh, Betsy Anderson, um, who's a faculty member in our school who teaches a number of our strategic communication um, courses. And it's a question about trust. And so, uh, and this relates to politics too, and, and how we, um, how uh, audience, uh, audiences and their views of uh, what they might want, their needs during pandemic um, may change. That is um, the needs at the beginning of the year to learn more about the election, to um, hear about the contest, to learn more stories about um, political issues or social issues that matter to them. But um, we're now seeing that people are more distrustful um, of media um, through um, Pew and some other uh, national surveys. And um, in addition, um, they're distrustful of politics too and, and politicians. Uh, and so the question I guess for Dan and for Ginny is, just um, how have you as an organization thought about this and um, has it changed or your investments in, for example, more entertaining, uh, entertainment programming or leisure programming um, in different ways? And, and then the second question, I guess, is how um, has your company thought about the issue of trust and how to continue to engage and uh, generate trust with its audience? Right. Well, the majority of our radio brands are really all about entertainment and all about um, more this year than ever escape from the news. Um, Dan has the challenge of trying to make sure that people don't venture into areas that of substance <laughs> or areas that matter and rather keep it to the People magazine and the TMZ and the you know, you know, Kanye West and his family, not his political career, you know, I mean, to really keep it um, an escape for people. Uh, the exception in the radio part of the company being WTOP in Washington, D.C., which is really very, very straight ahead, straightforward news. And I think that they have had a really great um, several months here of ratings. Uh, and the market manager there tells me he gets as many complaints from conservatives as he does from from liberals and so i think you know if you if you're hearing too many complaints from one one particular side of the aisle uh you might have something to worry about a bit but if everybody's mad at you you're probably okay and i don't know how kirk um rides that fine line every day but i'm sure that it's very much a part of of what he deals with on a daily basis and Dan, you may have something to offer as well. Yeah, we, I mean, Jenny's right. We're entertainment-based radio stations and, and um, we stay out of that. In fact, it is a no politics zone. And I think that's why people like to come uh, either listen to KS95 and, and the music or listen to the talk on my talk. Uh, we ran a spot because of our friends over at 5 and 45. We have the opportunity to do some cross promotion. And, and we ran a TV commercial that featured our talent sort of in this Zoom-like um, format uh, in, the, in the middle of all of this. And, and the message was, you know what? It's okay to take a break. It's okay to escape. If you need a chance to, 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 to smile or laugh, you know, th th we're here for you. And that's our role. And, and that's a good role. It's an important role to play. And I, I think sometimes our staff feels like what they're doing because they're not weighing into the issues or they're or they're not reporting this hard news that that what their role is minimized. And I completely disagree. We our role, we, you know, we I always tell them we can change somebody's day just by giving them something to laugh about or smile about in these very difficult times. So that's the role we've played and it's the role we'll continue to play. So basically what Dan just said is we don't want people to trust us. We no. Just, well we just want them to come for the fun. Which works for me. Yeah, I, I, well, Just kidding, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're going to trust. I mean, listen, they're going to trust that we deliver what our brand promises yeah. and our promises. And it's safe. 
right. place to get away for a while. Right. I don't know how I follow that. Um, <laughs> <I guess laughs> other than to say um, that Jenny's right, and, and when you asked the question, I immediately flashed on my first radio job in high school in my hometown of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, was at a um, an AM radio station playing music, what was then called Top 40. And after my second weekend of actually being on the air, uh, I went to my boss and said, look, I don't know if I can keep doing this. And he said, well, why? And I said, well, because the phone rings every three minutes and it's either somebody who really likes what I'm doing or they really hate what I'm doing. And, and I'm, I'm feeling a little weird about that. And he goes, that's awesome. He says, as long as they hate you or love you, but as long as they're calling, you're doing something right, keep doing that. And, and I, I, I think that's still true. I think if you're, if you're genuine and authentic about what you do, if you try to um, you know, offend everyone equally, as it were, or, or at least represent fairly, um, you're, you're, that's the best you can do. And the problem of the moment is that the term media uh, is all encompassing. You know, that media includes everybody from, you know, a large company that has a lot of media outlets and, and is in it to a person with a, a smartphone and a YouTube channel. Um, and so I, I think the, the bigger thing that I see more and more of is the distrust of it is also the frustration of folks trying to sort out what can they believe in, what's a legitimate source, um, and it requires more work. It used to be that that you know news consumption and, and media consumption was a pretty passive exercise, and that's pretty much blown up now. That you you have to do some level of your own editing and and managing, even if it's deciding, as my wife often does, much to my chagrin. I've had enough of the news right now. I, I need a break from that, as, as Dan said, and the commercial was spot on um, in that, you know, we don't expect people to consume news 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are people who do, but that most folks are, are trying to balance what they get and, and understand it. And I think the best part of that is trusting people and understanding on a local level that trust is is still very much in front of you. You know, if you're working in New York or, or LA, you don't see a whole lot of the folks who you're serving. You do on a local level. You still see them at the grocery store when you occasionally venture out. Um, you still get emails and phone calls from real people with real names. And I think that's been, you know, one of the things is trying as hard as we can to make sure we monitor the feedback we get and if we and if folks tell us enough folks tell us that they think we aren't doing a good enough job representing you know we we course correct and we make adjustments to try to make sure we're doing a better job with that we've touched on the election i want to make sure that we also um, touch on the issue of race and social unrest um, a bit um, within our local media um, industry the issue of how news media cover race, police actions, um, and challenges regarding to uh, diversity and equity in journalism have um, come up. Um, I know that WTOP um, in uh, JJ Green specifically um, has a new, um, uh, new podcast launched called Colors, Exploring America's Racial Divide in 2020 um, that's um, gotten a lot of interest um, from RTDNA and, um, and national attention and recognition. Um, how has Hubbard Broadcasting, Hubbard Radio, um, talked about um, its uh, coverage issues related to both unrest, but also just the broader questions of um, racial justice or equity um, and uh, diversity and representation as they've come up within your organization? Jenny, do you wanna start? Sure, I will try. Um, I am sorry about the phone. I don't know how to turn off the ringer. But um, we, we run a relatively decentralized operation in that um, JJ Green's podcast in Washington, D.C. was developed with the 
in the collaboration of that environment. It wasn't directed from St. Paul. It, you know, we were made aware of what was happening and that's the same, you know, in every location. My grandfather who started the company had a great commitment to fairness, justice, and um, equity. And I, we like to think that that's a concept that has been alive and well in our hiring and operating practices since the company started you know, in the, in the early 20s. Uh, but it takes on a different life in the midst of um, you know, all that, that we have experienced. And, but I, the people that run the business units have an understanding that there's an expectation of fairness, equity, and inclusion. Um, and where appropriate, that conversation has been, you know, more three-dimensional or less, depending on kind of what's happening. I, I, I know that Kirk, um, I mean, I think his team did a spectacular job of covering everything that happened in the wake of the death of George Floyd and what's continuing to be, a, you know, a very dynamic story even today. Um, and but from an employment perspective, uh, it 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 has not been a huge topic of conversation. It, but um, we point to our history, and we invite people to let us know if they feel that their treatment has has been anything less than equitable and fair. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. If it begs more questions, I you know I'm not sure. I think that's good. I think that hearing how um, organizations can really see some of these issues as a continuous issue within their organization, that's an internal one about um, how to include people, how to bring people into their organization, um, how to connect and represent communities. Kirk, can you speak a little bit more about um, how this topic has come up um, in your work? Well, it, it if I read the question correctly, it's kind of a twofold point, um, and I'll speak to the first one coming off of what Jenny said about hiring. You know, I consider every hire a diversity hire. Uh, I think every voice who comes into a newsroom should bring more than um, just whatever their resume says. And the idea of, you know, we try really hard to recruit and look at folks who, who can add uh, not only uh, a voice from a standpoint of color, uh, a standpoint of culture, a standpoint of whatever. What, what's, what does each individual candidate for a job potentially add to this collective that we put together every day? And, and the, the candor about it is, is we always want to do more and do, and do it better. And it's hard. I, I, I don't think there's anybody I know of who leads a newsroom who wouldn't tell you that they've done some, but there's always more to be done. There are always more folks that we should try out to go out and reach, um, that we should be representative, that, that we look at our staff as a whole, are we representing the community we serve? And that's very much a work in progress. I don't for a moment represent that we have it nailed down here. Uh, we can and will do better on that because it's something um, that, that's part of the legacy of the company, but it's also just something you want to do from a standpoint of being in the news business and, 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 and getting to those stories that you might not get to if you weren't connected in some fashion. If somebody in your newsroom didn't say, hey, are you aware of this as an issue or something as a story that needs to be um, uh, developed and, and brought to the public. And, and beyond that, I think the question of what we've done during the course of the year, particularly in covering the social unrest and, and the riots um, that followed, was very much first about trying to go and capture the story as, as correctly as we could. Because there is, anytime you go out and try to document something, there's always the, the question of, what is your camera seeing or your microphone picking up? Because they're all to a great degree unidirectional and it's not always what's here that matters, it's what's behind you, it's the people, and, and it's hard to represent that. So we really focused on trying in the coverage to be as um, 
representative of what was happening in, in a 360 kind of way, but also I, I think beyond that, the safety of our people. You know, the reality of it is, is that journalists were not treated specially in any situation that I'm aware of across the United States and certainly not here in the cities in the context that we had folks who were gassed, we had folks who were, you know, knocked down by, by law enforcement trying, at least in their mind, to preserve order. So this was a story that for a lot of younger journalists, and, and we have a number of them here, was really a first time they had ever encountered something like that. That this really wasn't a story that followed any set of rules, but it, it required us as news folks and, and leaders in our newsroom to be very aware of what our people were up against in the field, communicate with them, and in some cases, order them out of a situation they didn't want to leave because it was a news story and it was happening, but their safety wasn't something we could assure and we weren't going to put anybody in harm's way um, to get a story and that, it, it, to get a story that we could get a different way. We had folks who were in harm's way. That's part of the job, we know, but balancing all of that really was a, a learning exercise for folks. And again, an exercise in, in trying to understand and talk to constituencies that we might not always have talked to as well as we should have. And that was and continues to be a learning experience for us each day. Thank you, Kurt. I see the time. I could talk with you each for hours, but I want to be mindful of the time that we have together. If you wouldn't mind and have just one last minute, I, I would like, uh, and if you have to go and hop off, that would be just fine as well. But I wanted to both thank you and ask you to share one bright spot you see moving forward for students. Any advice you can offer someone entering the business, the bright spots that you might see um, moving forward as they might seek jobs or um, employment opportunities and internships. Um, Jenny, can I start with you on that? Well, I, I think that um, storytelling has never been more important and, and there has never been more, a um, more prolific way to tell stories and to engage with, with audiences of all kinds. So, I think it would be a very exciting time, if not a little daunting time, to be a journalism or communication student. But I, I think the future is bright. And I think it's important to note that broadcasting this year will turn 100 years old. You know, with KDKA beginning um, in November of, of uh, you know, 100, uh, 1920. And our company started in 1923. And, I think the business is every bit, if not a whole lot more interesting than it was 100 years ago. So I, I think that both mediums have proved to be resilient and nimble and have the ability to expand and contract depending on what's going on, but it all comes back to a journalist, um, a journalist or a communicator's ability to connect with people and to tell a story. So. That's what I'll say, and thank you all for your time, and then I'll let Kirk and, and Dan answer. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thank you so much. Um, well, and to Jenny's point, I feel every one of those 100 years this year, I can tell you that. Um, I, I gotta be honest, I, if I'm you, I, I, uh, this is the most exciting time there is to be a communicator. I, 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 am, a, I am an alum um, of, of this fine institution. Um, Boy, we, we, our largest growth right now is coming on the digital side and it's coming on the social media side. And that, to Ginny's point, that ability to, to tell stories is important to us, but it's important to every one of our business partners. And we are now handling that for many of our business uh, partners. That's our largest growth initiative right now is is literally managing the social media for our advertisers and clients here throughout the entire country. And we need people like you. We need people um, that, that are great communicators, that are great storytellers. And the difference between you and me is the, the, these platforms, this way of communicating is in your DNA. You grew up with it. So to, to have that social media experience and, and to understand 
that there are more ways to communicate than just broadcast to, to radio or broadcast to television, which you guys do. It's just the way you operate every day, I, I think is really valuable to companies like ours. Thank let you me, so uh, much, Dan. Kirk. Yeah, let me let me chime in with, with I think Dan and, and Jenny are 100% correct, but I'm gonna add another element to it uh, specifically for those who are, are students and, and contemplating their future in this business. Here's the one, and Dan's right, we need you. Um, this, is, this is maybe the most challenging and interesting time uh, in, in communicating and journalism and broadcasting that, that I've seen and most people I know have seen, but where you have a unique advantage, where there really is this amazing opportunity, is that all of you have one of these. And this device changes everything. Because when I was you, grammatically incorrect and son of a public English teacher, I just did, um, I didn't have this. I had to go to my university and check out about a hundred pounds of equipment to go out and try to put together a television news story that I could show to somebody like Jenny or Dan or Rob, my boss, and say, hey, this is what I know about journalism. And that isn't your problem. You have a tool that allows you to create a podcast, to do a TV news report, to sample content from pretty much anywhere, so the trick here is not how you do it, it's what you do and understanding what the difference between good content and bad content is and what people are going to want to watch and consume in the future. And that is the real challenge. And that's the opportunity you have to learn the skills and techniques and, and practice them every day and, and become better communicators, I, I think that is the term of art these days, that, that's so much more than just a journalist or just a photographer or just a writer, that, that communicating and that ability to do that on a scale that can be seen by anybody instantly is the big challenge of where we are going forward. And it's, to me, exciting as hell. And so I'm all in on the opportunity and the growth of, of not only you and companies like this one, but the idea that the end game, that where we are when the new normal, whatever that is, settles in, is that there will be a need for people to do storytelling and communicate information as effectively as possible. And that's a great opportunity. Thank you all so very much. Thank you for being such wonderful supporters of the school, both Hubbard Radio, Hubbard Broadcasting, and, and really um, the broader media group. And um, thank you for also just being uh, innovators and also showing us the way our school is not immune to any of the challenges that we discussed today. We've been trying to figure out the way ourselves to, con to continue to innovate, to challenge our students to become better storytellers to continue to engage, um, to play, to entertain, um, to challenge, to provide thoughtful um, news and information um, stories for everyone, um, for a broader community. And so thank you so much for being here with me today. Our um, recording will be uh, available in the next day or so um, on our website. And I'll share that back with panelists and um, with viewers who'd like to See you again in the future. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.